into the water, my maternal grandfather was age water, and my paternal grandfather was also bitter water. So I'm originally from northern Arizona at, in a community called Bird Springs, Arizona. So I grew up both on and off the Navajo Reservation. So as Manny said, um, today I'll be talking about the old recording school on the Navajo Reservation. Um, this school was some place where uh, many Navajo children attended uh, boarding school in the early 20th century. Um, it is a federal Indian boarding school and the first federal Indian boarding school in the United States was here in Pennsylvania at Carlisle. And it was the idea of um, uh, Captain Richard Henry Pratt, who was initially in charge of Native American prisoners of war. And he used his experience there to develop the idea of uh, federally Indian boarding schools, which were run in a militaristic fashion. And they were not bougie places <laughs> where you got educated to become doctors, lawyers, and scientists. They were um, places that were for the um, assimilation of Native American children into Western society. And they intentionally targeted the children because um, they wanted to break down families and the continuation of our cultures and our communities. So we were separated from our families, and many of the tribes that went to Carlisle um, were from all over the country. Um, there were some that were sent from the Navajo Nation as well, but um, after uh, they got sick and were sent home, and one of the um, children died when they went home, then um, the Navajo people never wanted to send any of their children again to boarding school or Carla Indian School in particular, and also boarding schools in general. So 1879 is when Carlisle was first opened. It still exists um, uh, there, historical buildings, but it is a military base. You can go there to visit the Carlisle Indian School grounds. They do have historical markers throughout the, the boarding school. And the first thing you will see as you get to the boarding school is a large cemetery on the right side of the entrance, and those are all Native American children who died at Carlisle Indian School. So many of the tribes are now in the process of repatriating, um, working with the um, base, army base there to have their, their children return home um, to their reservations, to their tribes under the Native American Various Protection and Repatriation Act, which was passed in 1990, because many institutions across this country have Native American human remains, as well as burial items, which were illegally taken from um, you know, grave sites across the country. And also, um, so that law requires that institutions return those um, relatives back to tribes and the items they were buried with as well. It's a continuing, continuing process which has uh, not been, um, uh, it would probably take, uh, I think, an estimate, an estimate of how long it would take to return all Native American human remains from institution it was 400 years um, at the rate that they're going right now. So, um, I wanted to focus on the, the boarding school because this um, federal Indian boarding schools began to spread across the country after Carlisle was established and used as the model. And many of the boarding schools did exist also on um, tribal lands. So this is something that um, um, happened on the Navajo Reservation, and it was part of our treaty that we signed with the U.S. government in 1868 that we would be, um, uh, Native American children would be given an education um, and a, a school would be built. Schools would be built for all Native American or Navajo children um, at, um, on the Navajo Reservation, but this actually didn't happen in fully until the latter part of the 20th century. So it took that long before all children were able to have a, an education. So 
the, the first kind of schools that were built were usually schools associated with churches and um, or church run schools, I should say, and also the federal Indian boarding schools. So this list shows the um, schools that were built on the federal Indian boarding schools that were built on the Navajo reservation. And the Luke boarding school is um, here in this this part of the Southwest Navajo Reservation. And here um, our reservation is on in three states, Northern Arizona, um, the state of New Mexico, and also Utah. And on the entire western half of the Navajo Reservation, in the early 20th century, there was only the Luke Boarding School and the Tula City Boarding School that were opened. So um, this is a map of the, the campus that was uh, drawn in 1941. So the earliest building at Luke was this, this building here. It was built in 1909. And um, it has a courtyard in the middle where there was a, a basketball court. And then in the 1920s, they built um, this uh, actual school building here in 1923. And they built a separate dining hall here. And they also built a hospital there. And here, down here, just to the south of the school is Luke Trading Post that was established in 1912, and also, uh, or I think this was actually established at the same time the, the boarding school was, and then the mission, the Presbyterian Church was established in Old Luke at, uh, in 1912. So in boarding schools are customarily, at this time, part of their education was that they attend church that was required for them to be um, taught about Christianity, and they had to attend church. Um, this here is, on this side of the school, there's an eight foot high earthen mound that, that was a dike, and it still exists there to this day. And it was for the purpose of keeping out floodwaters because the Little Colorado River flowed at that time. Um, it's flowed uh, on this side of the school, the eastern, side, northeastern side, but the, the channel of the Little Colorado River changed and it started to change to flow this way right through the school and then south and then um, on the west side up to the, up to the uh, north. So the, the founders probably thought they were, you know, uh, doing a great thing by building next to a river, um, but they actually built an active flood flood. And so the river doesn't always um, exist, like it's, um, it flows when there's uh, rain storms and snowstorms. And it can be very dangerous when it's um, during flash, flash floods, it could you know, fl you know, flood really badly and just take away um, uh, people's cars or you know, people have been known to drown in this river. Uh, this, this is the original school building, and these photos I found in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and also in um, the Winslow Historical Society in Winslow, Arizona. Um, here you can see uh, this part of the school that was, this front part of the school that was built in 1923, and this is the back half of the school facing west. You can see how close the Little Colorado River is. And that is the hospital there. Um, and that, and um, one thing you have to remember is that these schools were built, um, that the construction of them was from natural stone from the area, but they were built, you know, in a Western um, architecture and not with any kind of acknowledgement of the Navajo cultural norms. We would never build a, a house or structure with the entrance facing north because north is associated with death. And these, all these buildings had the entrance facing north. So that could just, um, you know, be something that would wear on um, the, the mental uh, state of not only oops, the children, but also um, the, um, sorry. <laughs> the uh, mental um, concern of the parents as well, that their children
children are occupying these buildings where the entrance is facing north. So this is a construction of pictures I just found in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. of the campus, which was very large. It was approximately 125 acres. This, is, this structure there is called the clubhouse. That's where many of the teachers were housed. This is how it looks today. In 1966, according to one of the elders I interviewed, the Bureau of Indian Affairs came in and demolished all the buildings except for three buildings, three houses that Navajo families were living in. So it's like this is there's just a bunch of rubble on the ground. And Arizona on the Navajo Reservation, in this area, there aren't trees, it's not green, it doesn't rain all the time, it's like mostly sand and brush. So this gives you an idea of what the site looks like today. And it is a site, it is a historical archaeological site. And one of the reasons I wanted to research this place was because there, there has nothing been, nothing has been written about the site in history books other than mentioning the name of this school. But it was a very important place to the Navajo people that live, live here because they went to school here in the early 20th century when it was open from 1909 to 1942. They lived here, they worked here, and their children attended school here. Um, you can see here the Flagstaff, uh, the San Francisco Peaks in Flagstaff, Arizona, if you've ever been there. It's quite um, a beautiful mountain town and a lot of tourists come through Flagstaff. So, uh, Burke Spring or Loop is only about 45 miles away, and you kind of can see the eight foot high dike here. That just gives you an idea of what it looks like. Now, the Western Mountain is a sacred mountain to the Navajo. We believe that it is uh, protects us and watches over us. And so, I, I um, believe that when children um, were going to boarding school, at least they didn't have to go out of the traditional homelands of the Navajo people, for example, like going to Carlisle or Phoenix, Arizona. They were able to stay within their traditional homelands and their families were able to visit them at the boarding school, although they were not allowed to take them. So they were at the boarding school for nine months out of the year. And this just gives you a little idea of how many children attended the old boarding school. When it first opened in 1913, there was about 70 students, and then the highest time it was occupied, or that children went to school there was in, um, like in the 1920s when um, they had built those new buildings to accommodate more children, and the highest um, uh, amount of students was about a little over 400 students. And the students ranged in age from about eight to five years old to 21. So even though they only um, were uh, eight, eight grades at loop, they kept the students um, until they basically became adults, 21 years old. And many of the older students were um, intentionally um, retained so they didn't like progress every year to the next grade because they wanted to take advantage of the older children to run basically provide the labor to run the school. So they went, They were sometimes, um, when the inspectors would come, they would criticize the superintendent of the Lumboyan school um, because they were retaining older students intentionally and making them, for example, the boys work in the farm and never, they were just working in the farm. They weren't getting an education. They weren't going to school. They were staying at the farm and working the farm and not going to school. So that's um, some of the things that happened. So again, their education was very gendered. Um, they um, had the, women, the girls uh, learn how to do uh, sewing. Um, they were uh, learning how to sometimes, um, uh, they worked in the hospital as you know, helping the nurses. Um, so their edu vocational education was you know, learning how to be a housekeeper, learning how to sew, learning how to wash clothes, um, iron. That was the type of vocational education that they received. So the students were being prepared to become the laborers um, in American society. 
this is an um, enrollment record that I, I, I looked at at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and I did see my grandmother's name on the enrollment records, one of them. So I learned that she was only five years old when she started attending the Old Laporte School. So the reason why I wanted to research the Old Laporte School is because both of my grandparents, maternal grandparents, attended school here in the 1920s and 30s, and they used to tell me stories about their um, experience at Loop when I was a child. Both of my grandparents have passed away, and before I decided to, you know, long before I decided to go back to school, um, I was a non-traditional student, so as an older student, um, grad student, and um, so I unfortunately didn't get a chance to interview them. But on these enrollment records is a lot of information, like the tribes, mostly it was Navajo students from the immediate area that were attending school here. None of the white um, teachers or staff that were employed here wanted their children to attend the boarding school, so there were there were not white children in the boarding schools. Um, it was just uh, that for Native American children. Some of the uh, staff were from other tribes, and so you can see sometimes um, Hopi tribe will be listed um, as attending school here. So they kept these enrollment records, and one thing that was really shocking that I saw on these enrollment records was that numerous times, just like at Carlisle, students died at Loop, and that was really hard to read for me, and it was very shocking. That was before there was a lot of attention being brought to residential schools in Canada and boarding schools in the United States just recently. Um, in 2021, due to the fact that many unmarked graves are being found um, next to these uh, residential schools and boarding schools here in America. So in Canada, they're called res residential schools. In the United States, they're called boarding schools. I never thought I would see the way <coughs> where this would be national news because it has been ignored for so long. Nobody cared about Native American children being separated from their fam families and forcefully assimilated into American society in Indian boarding schools, or the fact that many of these children never made it home and they died at these schools. This was certainly the case at Loop as well, which was one of the most shocking things that I found in my research. So with the boys, they um, often learned, um, again, how to do blacksmithing, um, they worked in the farms, they learned how to do carpentry work, and um, they learned how to um, do blacksmithing, and they had um, shoe shops, so they, um, they built a lot of their own supplies. So um, the girls in their sewing classes, they were literally, um, the elders, when I talked to them, said when they were young, they would get clothes. But when they were older, they would expect to sew their own dresses. And so um, um, that's, that's what their vocational education was, was like. Um, so most of the younger students were, uh, based on the enrollment records, next to their names, they would put in school all day. And then for the older students, like 10 years and up, they would have jobs assigned to them. So next to their names would be like farm or black shop or, you know, hospital for girls or laundry, laundry room. So that gave you an idea of what the students, kind of st jobs the students had. So the stories of survivance, survivance are stories of Native Americans' resiliency in the face of colonization, and these stories um, empower our people. And these stories are often not heard because most of the stories about Native Americans are focused on the negative. Um, yeah, we have a lot of negative things that we deal with as a result of what we experience in colonization. However, there are also some survivance stories that um, are like stories that show the resiliency and the, the joy of Native American people. So my grandparents, they told me some sort of stories of survivance. For example, my grandfather, who you can see in this picture, um, he told me the story that when he was at boarding school, he 
um, got a, they would get Christmas gifts every Christmas, and he got a, a cap done one year. Because he was taking blacksmithing and car, you know, that kind of job, uh, or learning that kind of work, he was able to refashion his toy gun into a real gun. <laughs> and him and his friends would hide the gun uh, under a bush, and then they would take it out and and they would um, go beyond the school grounds and go hunting for jackrabbits because they were starving. This, there's many stories of this, or the elders that I spoke with who I interviewed who went to school here told me time and again that they were always hungry. And so they, um, he, him and his friends would hunt rabbits and then they would cook them out, out, out there and, and out of, um, surveillance of the boarding school and they would eat the rabbits. So this is a story of survivance and it shows how students were resilient and they were able to fight back against, you know, the rules and regulations and the oppression that they were experiencing and also the hunger that they were experiencing at the boarding school, not getting up to eat. They were able to reconnect with their culture of you know, they already knew how to um, hunt rabbits and cook them and make fire on their own. So that's something that they continue to practice. So it's a story of survivance, of subsistence way of living that the children continue to do beside, despite the fact that they were in the federal Indian boarding school. Um, one of the other stories of uh, an elder I interviewed, Alex Riggs, involves the, the formation of um, eh relationships. Eh and Navajo means our um, kinship relationships. We don't only have good relations with our relatives who we um, identify through clanship, so we have blood relatives, but we also have clan relatives. So if, if one of you would happen to be Bitterwater clan, then I would consider you based on your age, you would, you know, if you were my age, I would you would be my sibling because we were both the same clan and I would, we would have a close relationship immediately because of that. Those kind, that kind of kinship relationship continued to exist within the boarding school. So many of the students, you know, they knew their clans and they knew who they were related to. And also um, many of the um, ways that um, women are brought up or young girls in um, matrilineal families it is, was, their role was to care for children. So Alex Riggs was cared for by an older teenage girl who would help him fight off the older boys who were taking his food from him when he was in the cafeteria. So there was a bullying, the, a bullying that was occurring at these boarding schools that was not being um, addressed by the staff working there. And he would, he would be hungry because the older boys would take his food and he wouldn't get to eat. So there was a teenage girl that used to literally fight the boys, fight them off while he would, so he could eat his food. So um, that just shows you a continuation again of that um, mothering gender role of, of women and young girls and how it's continued in the space of a federal Indian boarding school where those relationships were broke, meant to be broken down. Um, another uh, story of uh, survivance and Hope, um, Hope Harrison and Lucinda um, Agent were sisters and they attended the Olu boarding school. Um, their grandparents lived about 10 miles away from the school and would, they would visit. And when they would visit, they would park behind that eight foot high uh, earthen dike, and um, they would bring always bring food for their grandkids, and also they would invite other students, um, their grandkids' friends. So the students, when they would see um, their the wagon, um, they would get excited, and they would tell um, uh, Hope and Lucinda that your grandparents are here. Let's go over there. And because they knew they would get fed. So that is a very important relationship between grandparents and grandchildren because the grandparents are the teachers of the younger generation, which continue to exist in this small way, although their their, their granddaughters were not allowed to leave the boarding school. 
they were um, able to come visit and they were able to share traditional foods and feed their grandkids and continue that um, and relationship. And they also were known to donate food to the boarding school. So they had fields of corn and melon, and they also had herds of sheep. So they would often come to the Luke Boarding School and donate um, watermelon and also um, corn, and also uh, they would butcher sheep and donate the, the, the meat to the school as well for the children. So um, one of the surprising stories I also heard is that normally boarding schools are only thought of as stripping the culture and language away from the Native American children. However, in the 1930s, the uh, policies of the um, federal government started to change so that they would include safe aspects of the culture, such as learning crafts and learning um, you know, simple songs and um, in the language of the tribe. And that became incorporated into um, um, the, the, the curriculum at this point, which was very surprising to me. So in talking to the elders, I learned from part of Curly that they were learning to weave at Blue Boarding School as part of their home economics education. And I was like, I, I didn't believe her <laughs> at first. I was like, really? Um, and she said that she already knew how to weave, so she would always help the students um, along with their Navajo teacher who was teaching them. This is uh, Marie Martin there, uh, who many of the uh, elders I interviewed had memories of specifically Marie Martin, their Navajo weaving teacher. And, and she said, I used to help the teacher because I already knew how to weave. And so this has become a safe space in federal Indian boarding schools that one of the books that I recommended, um, Shanna, uh, Tamina Lomawaima and Teresa McCarthy's book, they talk about these safe spaces within federal Indian boarding schools where the culture and the language was taught that the acceptable, quote, safe aspects so they would only teach certain things such as women's craft work. And um, the, the, the Navajo traders were usually white on the Navajo reservation. The trading posts were run by white trading post owners and they had um, a huge organization in the 20, early 20th century. And I'm pretty sure that they probably pushed the US government to, to teach the girls or allow them to learn how to weave because it benefited them financially. So um, it was very surprising to me that she told me the story that they were learning to weave and also that in this safe space of the home economics, they were allowed to speak Navajo with their teacher. So in school, they weren't allowed to speak Navajo, and if they did, they would get punished and they would be, you know, either uh, whipped or they would have to eat soap um, if they spoke Navajo in school. But you know, all they did, another story on survivance is that they didn't speak Navajo in front of their teachers. But when their teachers were not around, they spoke Navajo. And also, the girls were allowed to speak Navajo to their Navajo teacher in the weaving class. So that was a place where they were allowed to um, learn their culture, speak their language uh, within the federal Indian boarding school system. And I think that's another story of survivance that helps students maintain their identity, their culture, and their language, even though they are in an institution that is trying to assimilate them into Western society. I don't know how much more time I have. How much more? Oh, okay. So these photos I found in uh, Winter Rock, Arizona, in the uh, archives at the Navajo Nation Museum. If you ever go to the Navajo Reservation, we do welcome tourism. That's something that we depend on for our economy. So uh, I would encourage you to go to Winter Rock and visit the Navajo Nation Museum. They always have wonderful exhibits there. And this is where I found the pictures of the students. Beautiful, these beautiful pictures of students from the old boarding school. This actually.
actually was a photo that Arden Curley shared with me that she had. Um, these are just a picture of boys playing outside of the dormitory at the so um, one of the pictures I really like is that um, the picture of a porcupine. Um, so the teachers really use the um, flora and fauna of the uh, loop area to educate the students. So they often take nature walks and um, take notes. And I think they they pressed plants and they also I think collected insects. And along the Little Colorado River, there's a, there was a lot of cottonwood trees, but now due to invasive, invasive species like tamarisk, um, which comes from the Middle East that was grown at the school, or hedges, it just like spread all over um, and it um, uh, killed the, the, the um, uh, cottonwood trees that used to grow at the um, in the 1940s, uh, the school was really, um, there was some uh, cutbacks for the Napa education and they wanted to close some of the schools on the reservation and because we had issues with repeated flooding inc incidents, um, um, they had to close, uh, they did the, the, you know, all of the um, correspondence that we read from the Washington DC Commissioner of Indian Affairs back to the superintendent at Loop um, was that you know Loop was slated to be closed in 1942. Also at this time, the um, US government was beginning another um, um, initiative due to the fact that Coral Harbor was um, bombed uh, by the Japanese Empire in 1941, and they decided to um, imprison these Japanese um, uh, concentration camps. A movie that was recently uh, produced called A Bitter Legacy um, is, um, oh, I, can't, I can't remember her name, but if you look up A Bitter Legacy, um, the Japanese film director uh, talks to uh, some Navajo people and she focuses on the Loop Isolation Center. So, in 1942, the Loop Boarding School closed. Um, according to the archival records, we don't really, it, it, it could have been because of the flooding, it could have been, you know, also because of the fact that they were, the Navajo people were having budget cutbacks to their educational budget from the federal government. It could also have been pressure from the uh, Department of War because they were trying to find a place to but imprisoned Japanese Americans. And so Loop popped up on their radar. It could have been a combination of all these three. We don't, you know, the, the archival information hints to that. Um, at any rate, the, the Japanese American people who were troublemakers in all the other camps that were um, established the, they were sent to the Loop Isolation Center in um, about uh, March of 1943. So the um, the reasons that they were trouble trouble label troublemakers was um, you know for a, a lot of times it was just the Japanese American people <coughs> trying to stand up for their rights. You know, asking why are we being imprisoned? When are we going to get out? You know, and um, they're fighting for their rights within these uh, Japanese um, concentration camps. You know, they're not getting fed enough. They're not. Uh, they're being treated harshly by the military. Um, you know, all of these things that they're trying to, you know, address made them troublemakers, and so they were sent to the the, the loop isolation 
Center, which was created at the Luke Morgan School. So um, on this map that we first looked at, there was um, a drawn on it, a um, fence that you can barely see here. And then in the corners, there's a little arrow that says Watchtower. And so this refers to the fence that, um, oops, here, that was built at the heart of the campus. And on each corner, there was a watchtower. So there was about 150 uh, military men stationed at the Loop Isolation Center and about 70 Japanese American men who were sent there and imprisoned there with no, um, um, they were not given any information about any kind of hearing or any kind of um, time, you know, that they needed to do. Um, they were separated from their families at the um, other camps that they were at. Um, so they had no representation, no legal representation. They were just sent there. So this is often thought by Japanese scholars as a precursor to Guantanamo Bay or a um, model for Guantanamo Bay. Um, uh, but after nine months, um, they did, or they did get a, a director who was familiar with working Jap with Japanese people because he owned some farms in California and many of his farmers were Japanese. So he already had a, an established good relationship with um, Japanese American people. But he ended up becoming the uh, director of the Loop Isolation Center, Mr. Paul Robertson, and he developed a good relationship with many of the prisoners there and advocated on their behalf to the Department of War that there is no reason for this, in this loop isolation to exist and for these men to be imprisoned because they can do, they essentially, for like, 99% of them did not do anything that would warrant them to be imprisoned in this unjust manner with, um, you know, this uh, severe, um, as American citizens, you know, the, the, this was severely an unjust treatment where they, they were just imprisoned without any representation or any, any um, way to, you know, in a court system, address, um, have someone defend their their innocence because that was not happening. So he managed to um, get the loop isolation center closed and um, uh, uh, the men after um, uh, December 1943 they were sent back to um, uh, uh, the camps that they they came from or other um, other um, camps that were for uh, Again, troublemakers, but for loop, for the the loop isolation, it only lasted nine months, and then it was permanently closed. And after that point, the boarding school was never used as a boarding school again, even though the community wanted it to reopen because they wanted um, a school close um, to the, the the community, so that they they were having the problem of having to send their children farther away. To Chuba City Boarding School, which is you know, about 80 miles away from Loop, and um, they didn't they didn't want their children that far away, and plus the Loop School provided a lot of employment for the locals, and because that the, that that school wasn't there anymore, a lot of people had to find employment off the reservation, and um, also there was that hospital that was there, and they depended on that hospital. Because it was open to the community and to the students for the students. So, you know, they wanted that hospital back as well. And they I've read um, letters from the Loop community, uh, Navajo people requesting from um, they sent letters letters to the senators at that time in Arizona that the school be reopened because you know they want wanted um, their children to be educated there closer to home. Of course, that never happened. This was really just stood abandoned. Um, my mother, as a child, remembers playing in these abandoned.
abandoned buildings. Um, she said they used to climb up um, because some of them had slides on the outside of the, um, uh, the building, the first building that was built in 1909, and the kids used to slide down that slide. I guess it was a fire escape. So um, um, these are just some stories that I wanted to share with you a little bit with you today about my research of the old boarding school, and I'm just now delving into more research of the Loop Isolation Center, and hopefully I'll be working with some archaeological uh, archaeology um, uh, professors, and we would like to do uh, record this as a archaeological site and do non-invasive um, archaeological research. Probably, definitely mapping the site because it has never been mapped by an archaeologist, and maybe doing some surface analysis of the artifacts and perhaps some digital storytelling website or some kind of um, historical trail that you could access with your phone and an app. So we would like to do some kind of project there at the um, actual historical site of um, the old boarding school. So thank you so much for your attention today. Thank you, Dr. Tuberis. Um, what an amazing presentation. We want to offer some time now for folks um, to ask a question. We're going to have a little Q&A. If there are any questions or anything that we would like to comment, um, reflect upon, the what we say So with that, uh, we open it up to everyone. Actually, I have two. Um, the, the first, the, the Indian boarding schools, are they fully federally funded? Yes. So the U.S. government funded everything? Um, and the second question is, is it unique that, that like, Luke was in the community? Is it, was that unique among the boarding schools that are in the community? Um, I'm not really, I, I think, um, well, I'm not really sure about other tribes, but I think, it, it, I think there were boarding schools that were um, adjacent to reservations as well, but I don't really know. The Navajo Nation is, is a unique case because we are the largest, we have the largest reservation of all the tribes. And so um, I think because of that reason um, and due to the fact that it, at that time especially, it's very, very um, hard terrain to, tra terrain to travel over. And so boarding schools, um, especially on the Navajo Reservation, made the most sense because um, if it rains or snows, you really get, um, you can't travel because you would get stuck in the mud um, if you had a wagon and if you have a car. And today that situation still exists pretty much on the Navajo Reservation. So uh, at that time, yeah, I think due to the fact that the Navajo people had such a large reservation and a large population compared to other Indian tribes that, that are of any Her mother died when she was young, 
and the father just decided to take her to boarding school because he didn't know how to raise her on his own. And even though she was being raised by her grandmother, her grandmother did not want her to go to boarding school and was crying and holding on to her and begging the father to let her take care of the daughter. But the dad, you know, this is all according to Western uh, ways of doing things. They consulted with the father only and ignored the grandmother's wishes. And um, since the father wanted his daughter to go to school, they um, took the daughter from her grandmother and um, put her in boarding school because he wanted her to get an education and he didn't want to raise her himself and obviously didn't want the grandmother to raise her. Do you have a question? Um, yes. Um, is this a further refinement on why is it that the children were funded? Could you clarify that at that point? Um, federal Indian boarding schools were not well uh, funded. So in 1928, I believe there was a Brookings uh, report that uh, was called the Marion Report, done by the Brookings Institute of all federal Indian boarding schools across the country, and they found them the uh, they found many problems with federal Indian boarding schools. That children were diseased in boarding schools. They had tuberculosis, high rates of tuberculosis, and um, they um, were overcrowded. They weren't getting enough heat during the winter. Um, again, children were dying at these boarding schools. They were being severely punished. Um, so they documented all of these things that were wrong with federal Indian boarding schools, and that's why I think in the 1930s they began to change the policies, for example, to include um, Indian arts and crafts and the language of the in some of the boarding schools. So, um, is the meeting actually produce money for the people who are doing the meeting at boarding schools? No. The, one of the elders I interviewed. Lucinda said that when she finished her rug, the trading post owner gave, only gave her two dollars. And she said, never again, I'm not doing this again for that amount of money. And then the other person, Arvid, said that when they would finish the rugs, the teachers would sell the rugs and keep the money and not give it to give it back to the students. So those are a couple of the stories that um, the elders said about that. I'm second question. And it's actually for your colleague. Um, you uh, read the, uh, read the land acknowledgement statement. That's the first time I've ever heard it read by someone who is vaguely indigenous. My question is I hear it by white people all the time, and it's been bothering me. I wonder how indigenous people feel about uh, hearing white people read that, because I always find it to be a little humble. We have the man we're really sorry, but we're not going to do that. So, could you clarify that for me? I really don't need to understand that um, so I can share it with my students. Yeah, um, I think the, the perspective varies from individual to individual. Um, I can say from someone who uh, is not uh, indigenous to like the United States, but is from South America and Mexico, that um, in my perspective, um, I, I recognize the educational positive of actually being able to introduce folks who might not even um, be privy to, to what the Latin Council is or whose territories we're currently fighting on. Um, so I I think um, I think this is one of the few cases in my personal perspective where the the impact um, is just as valuable, if not a little more so than the intent, uh, because there's so many of our community members currently residing within uh, not only these lands but all around the United States that. I've never had the opportunity to hear a language question. So that beginning introduction is I think a first step in dismantling those colonialistic structures that uh, are currently fighting that. But um, uh, it's 
a wonderful question. I also love to turn out to start to some players or my colleagues as well. Um, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. Oh, but I never mind, please. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not using my loud voice today. <laughs> um, I, I appreciated hearing uh, the blend. Um, what do you call it? Blend. The blend acknowledgement. I never had, I didn't know what to say. It was a blend acknowledgement statement. And I heard it many times, uh, every time before today, coming from white people. Mm -hmm. And it always, honest to God, bothered me. I'm, I think you can tell a white person. Um, and it seemed hollow. Um, it seemed like we were saying it because it makes us politically correct to say it. But after we will land back, well, we want you all to know that we're aware that this land belongs to indigenous people. And I've always been bothered that wondering how indigenous people thought about that statement, particularly from um, white folks. Usually white males have. Oh, I see, I see. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I want, I want to just respond to you. And, Kind of extend what Manny was saying. Um, we have a different stand than other communities or other people may have. So when we drafted our land acknowledgement, was also intended to bring awareness about the territory where we are, but at the same time, we have a commitment to the Lenape uh, in that work. So it is not just lip service. We have been developing over the seven years that we've been doing Indigenous People's Day an enormous effort to maintain relationships and develop relationships. So currently, one of those relationships that came out of this you know, is also we created the Lenape Program Working Group um, with Lenape, who comes to the annual event and is developing ideas about how they want to engage in their homecoming story and also in their own narrative and reclaiming the history. So in some ways, we are only sort of like serving as a conduit or as a catalyst to uh, make motion or, you know, connect and expand what it needs to be done. And so that's why we do our land acknowledgement. And, and as you hear, our land acknowledgement is actually uniquely different than the one that often you will hear from other folks, because make, we make it an attempt to say that there's issues that has not been addressed. And we're not the ones who are gonna to have to, I mean, we can collaborate and be in good relations, you know, but not um, take on the ownership of that. It has to be by the Lenape and all the other tribes that are here. And actually I would like to, I don't know if, I, there is a Lenape is present here too, uh, in Cherokee, and uh, Sonia, I don't know if you would like to say a few <laughs> things just to, because you are here, and um, I know you don't speak for everybody, but it's like, I want to acknowledge you so that way you guys can also, there's always people in the room, you know, and that's important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a member, I'm a dual member, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, which I grew up on, the Cherokee Reservation of Oklahoma, and then, um, of course, um, on the paternal side, I'm part of the Delaware tribe, which is part of the Nava. I think it's great when there's a, an acknowledgement. First off, because the Delaware tribe and the Lenape are so far removed from this area, they were forced, they were one of the first to be forcefully removed to Oklahoma. When I saw that map, that's the first time I've seen it. Um, and I grew up heavily involved with my family on the Delaware side. Um, and I honestly was like, oh, well, that, that would explain why I have the one ancestor from Ohio, right? As it goes through. So I think it's great because even as a Lenape tribal member, I don't know that. Um, and, and Maybelle kind of alluded to this, but we're just now, these tribes are just now getting back into the area and becoming involved in the archaeological and anthropological efforts that are going on here. Um, so I think it's a good linkage to put together. And you know what? My husband's a white man. I would really appreciate if he gave land acknowledgement when he would stand up and <laughs> So you know, I think it's, it's in the spirit, right? It's in the spirit of wanting to do the right thing and doing the right thing. And you know what? It's I, I can only find, I don't even know if there's any other Delaware tribal members in this area. I just happen to be pop here. So um, it's a work in progress. 
part. So I appreciate the acknowledgement. Thank you so much. <laughs> Did you have a question? Oh, no. oh, no, 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 I already asked a question. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, you used the word uh, survivance instead of survival, and I was wondering, I, I, I'm not uh, familiar with the use of this word in this context, so I was wondering if you kind of elaborate right briefly. Yeah, I think um, the, the word survivance was coined by Gerald Wisner, who is a, a native, native um, Anishinaabe Ojibwe author. And um, it's a way for Native people to speak about the resiliency of our people in the face of colonization. What are those stories? How did we respond to different situations that um, shows the strength and pride of our people? You know, how did we continue to exist as you know a nation, a tribal nation, and also you know with our identity, our um, self-esteem, our culture, you know, our language. Um, what are those stories? Um, because, again, a lot of the things that make the news are the negative things, you know, high suicide rates, high alcoholism, um, but what are people doing in their communities today or have they done in the past as well? What are those stories of, of how they, they um, came together as a community or you know, individually to, I guess, survive again? As, as, a, as, a, as a tribal group, you know. So I think those are, those are stories of survivors. And they exist in every tribal nation. Yeah. There aren't very many Native American people in the country um, due to the fact, of course, you know, of, of, of you know, estimates of 90% of indigenous people die because of the diseases that we didn't have any um, defense against, like smallpox. That's one thing that you will read also in these um, historical records of boarding schools that often these diseases would come through the boarding schools and kill a lot of the children, such as smallpox. Uh, that certainly happened at the old boarding school. But, you know, because of the facts of, you know, removal, forced removal from our, our land base and continuously taking away our freedom to live as we did, to eat what we did, to live off of the land, to worship, all of those things paid a heavy toll on indigenous people. So that, you know, there's probably about less than 5 million indigenous people in the United States today. But we are um, increasing uh, our population growth is uh, very high. So that's the good news. And we still exist. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we're not extinct. Mm -hmm. Don't think of us that way because we're here. And anywhere you are in this country is indigenous land. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very enlightening. I wonder why the Canadian case is so popular as contrary to this one. And, and also, as an anthropologist, how it was for you to, you know, because you, I'm a historian, and so usually we need a certain distance when we study something. And I've been trying to understand more ego history. And, and I realized that there are a lot of emotions, right, when we write about our own conditions. And so I was wondering, uh, I mean, in your case, how it was to, you know, you told us about your grandparents, and so, because I know that anthropologists should have a certain distance, and so how it has been for you to study something that is very, you know, traumatic? Um, I guess. I can say that I'm definitely, um, I guess I'll answer it in two ways. First, I love learning about 
my tribe's history and I love learning from elders because that's the traditional way that the Navajo people educate ourselves is we learn from the elders. Um, I've always been interested in learning more about myself as a Navajo person because I don't speak my language fluently, even though I know how to read and write it. I know a lot of words in Navajo. I don't understand Navajo um, when it's spoken to me. So my goal has always to learn more about my history and culture and my language. Secondly, as an anthropologist, I prescribed to decolonizing research methods, and that's what my dissertation was written as. Part of decolonizing research methods is to, um, um, for indigenous people, um, for researchers, it, it allows for the fact that we learn uh, from our elders. So that is part of decolonizing research. So I, <coughs> I'm definitely someone that incorporated decolonizing research methods, even though I'm an anthropologist and we're taught to be objective, you know, scientists in, in, in corporate scientific method, I am more of a person that wants to incorporate community-based research and learning from my elders, thus decolonizing the field of Um, a 
lot of people that lived during that time. You know, I'm in the 90s and late 90s, so. Away and very hungry right now, especially with COVID. A lot of the Native American elders uh, passed away over the COVID pandemic yet. Did you get vaccinated? We did get vaccinated. Well, the, the problem was is that um, only, you know, there's like uh, a lack of running water on the reservation. Like 50% of the homes still do not have running of water or electricity. So, how can you wash your hands if you don't have running water? We have the highest rate of vaccination. Tribal groups, unlike the rest of America, embrace vaccinations because of the fact that we didn't want our elders, our cultural knowledge people to be affected by COVID. So the Navajo Nation has a very high rate of vaccination. I think it's like 80% or something like that. We want to, um, a uh, real quick comment, just before we go to lunch, um, we're chilling. <laughs> 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 In, um, the, in um, the gallery that is called um, uh, Connecting Past and Present Upstairs, part of the Rising Sun Exhibition, we have on view um, a drawing from a student um, who is from the, the Plains tribe, the Lakota, but was at a boarding school in, um, in New York, I believe. Um, we have a Papa, is, that's our oldest a portfolio of representation of indigenous art is from the 1870s and so there's one drawing by one of the students at a school and I just thought you want to know that and when you when you have a look at the exhibit it's, it's a treasure and um, and it's up in the gallery um, you'll see with the chair but, but anyway I just want to let people know <laughs> I uh, want to thank you, uh, everyone, for being engaged in your questions. Uh, we're going to take a short five minute intermission um, so that everyone has a chance to grab a snack. Please help yourself to the back. Please grab mm -hmm. and stretch your legs. Once we come back, we'll be uh, transitioning into the second part of the seminar, a little group workshop. Um, but we'll see you 